Good afternoon. Thank you all for being here. Welcome to this very special event that celebrates both the Maxwell School's 90th anniversary and also our longstanding relationship with the Teach for America program. I'm Ross Rubenstein, Associate Dean and Chair of the Department of Public Administration and International Affairs, and we are very excited to be co-sponsoring this event with the Public Affairs Program. When we first started planning this event, we started asking ourselves, how could you characterize the relationship between the Maxwell School and the Teach for America Program? And the answer to that question became the title for this symposium a shared sense of mission. As TFA has grown and expanded over the years, it became increasingly clear that TFA and the Maxwell School graduate and undergraduate programs were attracting many of the same types of people, those with a commitment to citizenship and to serving the public good. And it also became increasingly clear that in many cases, these were the exact same people as many graduates of the Public Affairs Program went on to participate in Teach for America, and many former TFA participants came back to grad school and enrolled in our graduate programs in public administration and international relations. In the past 13 years since we began a formal partnership with Teach for America and began actually tracking these numbers, the Public Administration and International Affairs Department has welcomed 40 TFA alums into our graduate programs. And 63 public affairs majors have graduated from the university and gone on to participate in Teach for America. And that represents over one third of the total number of TFA participants at Syracuse University. And today we're very fortunate and very happy to welcome back four, five guests who remain committed both to TFA and also to the Maxwell School. And they're gonna share their thoughts and experiences with you and have a discussion about the relationship between TFA and Maxwell. And I'll first introduce our moderator, Cora True Frost, and then she'll introduce each of our panelists and lead the discussion, which will then be followed by Q&A. Cora True Frost is Assistant Professor of Law in the Syracuse University College of Law. Her scholarship draws from the areas of international relations theory, administrative law, and public international law. She teaches classes in international and domestic com criminal law and international human rights law. In her legal practice, she worked at the Judicial Systems Monitoring Program in East Timor, where she published the first report on women's access to the formal justice sector and established a women's justice unit. She also served as legal consultant to the Fafana defense team before the special court in Sierra Leone, led the NGO working group on women, peace, and security at UN headquarters, and was a litigation associate at Cravath, Swain, and Moore, LLP. Professor True Frost was a fellow at the Safra Foundation for Ethics and the Professions at Harvard University, where she earned an LLM from Harvard Law School as a Gammon Fellow. Most important for us, of course, she also earned a JD MPA, magna cum laude, as one of two law fellows at Syracuse University College of Law and the Maxwell School. And prior to law school, Professor True Frost taught middle school English and social studies for two years in Baltimore with Teach for America and also for two years in Harlem. So please welcome Professor Quara True Frost. Hi, everybody. It is a real pleasure to uh, to be moderating this panel um, and about two organizations I'm very excited about, uh, the Maxwell School and Teach for America. As Ross mentioned, uh, both have in common an interest in social justice and a commitment to making change happen. I was reminded of that just now when I sat down in front of this very drafty event. I was complaining about it, and our panelists said, why don't we move? And I thought, aha, here's action right here, social, <laughs> socially minded um, activists. So um, I thought I'd just, I'd mention that before I introduce our panelists and uh, before we hear from them, that Although I've worked in some very challenging situations, including post-conflict settings like Sierra Leone and um, East Timor, 
the, the most rewarding and most challenging work experience I've had so far were the two years I spent as a Teach for America core member in Baltimore, uh, Maryland. It was by far the uh, most powerful experience that I've had and one that has shaped the, my future career path in ways that I did not anticipate at the time. But, um, but I think the fundamental thing that, uh, that being a teacher in an extremely challenging school setting, the school where I taught, I think there were approximately 14 new teachers hired that year, most of whom were trained in traditional educational programs, um, but only two of us lasted past the first six weeks of school. Uh, the rest of the teachers quit gradually over that first six weeks. So I was, um, I was one of the early Teach for America Corps members, 1992. In fact, my presence here adds a decade of our representation uh, of Teach for America Corps members because our four panelists were Corps members um, between 2001 and 2012, I think. And I bring in an extra decade at 1992. So, um, but at any rate, uh, the kind of uh, the access that I had to students who really, really needed me taught me right off the bat that it is possible to make change. I know for a fact that there are individual students who I helped. I was I was working um, in a system that was incredibly challenging, but I still recognized. My first job, I learned that it's possible to make a difference, and that's part of what led me to later to apply to the Maxwell School and to law school to try to get the tools that I could use to help make the world a better place still. So, and um, our panelists here are all have all found ways to use their Maxwell degrees. Three people here are Maxwell undergraduate uh, graduates, and one is a Maxwell graduate school graduate, Alex. Um, and without further ado, I'll introduce each of them and, um, and ask them to give us a bit about their experience and how Teach for America has, um, Teach for America and Maxwell, how those two experiences have shaped what they're presently doing. And then I'll, I have a couple other questions for you later. Um, but so immediately to my left is Dana Twyman, who was, uh, who was a graduate in 2001 uh, and had a bachelor's degree. She taught seventh grade literacy at New, at New York City, um, in New York City as a Teach for America Corps member. I'd love for you to say more about what literacy meant. It sounds maybe similar to my teaching remedial reading. Uh, we didn't offer English at my middle school because none of the students at the school had passed the standardized English test. So the only class we offered was uh, remedial reading, and everybody was in it. Um, since then, she's worked in the not-for-profit sector, supporting students, teachers, and administrators, uh, both in and out of school settings. I was speaking with her earlier. She said she loves being back in the schools. She spent the last five years working with Diplomas Now in Philadelphia. Diplomas Now is a collaborative effort between three national nonprofit organizations that provides comprehensive support services to students in middle and high schools. And prior to join, joining Johns Hopkins, Dana served as the Diplomas Now program director for City Year Greater Philadelphia. Uh, Dana's also trained teachers to conduct servants learning projects with Need Indeed and directed youth and family programs throughout Philadelphia. She earned her BA, as I mentioned here, in policy studies at Syracuse University in 2001, a Master of Science in Teaching at Pace University, and an MPP at the University of Michigan. Alex, who I've had the pleasure to meet before as a student in my classroom uh, it, at, at here in Syracuse. Um, I'm pointing to the law school, which now is down the hill, but so cumulatively here. Um, Alex came to Maxwell after teaching in rural North Carolina with TFA. Um, was that a little show of support for North Carolina out there? Um, while he was at Maxwell, he interned for uh, Senator Kristen Gillibrand and uh, tutored through the Say Yes to Education program. He then worked to, on the Obama campaign as an advanced staffer, moved to DC to work with the not for profit Partnership for Public Service, and he has been, or he was selected rather, as a TFA Capitol Hill Fellow with Congressman Rush Holt. Uh, where he is, that's where you're still working, right? But, but now, that's right, as a, in a different capacity, right? So he's now a staffer on, um, on Congressman Holt's 
um, team, and you still tutor? Great, still tutor students um, through the DC not-for-profit Horton's Kids. Uh, Robert here graduated 2008 from Syracuse University. He's the co-founder of the Urban Assembly for uh, School, sorry, for Emergency Management. It's a career in technical education, which I'm sure he'll tell us more about, high school that's located in downtown Manhattan. Um, he came to education through Teach for America, where he taught math in grades 7 to 12 in the South Bronx. He's also helped support teachers and students as an instructional lead and data coach. And prior to teaching, he worked at the Pennsylvania governor's office for the mayor of Syracuse and at an international law firm in Hong Kong. Um, he earned his BS as a triple major, I didn't know that existed, as a triple major in public policy, economics, and international relations uh, from Syracuse, where he graduated as a university scholar. Uh, Patricia Leon Guerrero it graduated in 2004. She's the managing director of Latino engagement and partnerships for Teach for America, the national core that we're talking about uh, today. In her role as managing director, which I'm sure she'll tell us more about, she collaborates and manages TFA's national partnerships with top Latino nonprofit organizations to ensure TFA is enlisting the best and the brightest Hispanic leaders. Uh, she served in a number of other capacities with TFA, including as part of the 2004 Las Vegas Valley Charter Corps. Um, and she served for three years with TFA, co-founding the first parent teacher association for elementary school. She helped raise $10,000 for the students and staff. And here at SU, she pursued de a degree in public policy, sociology, and Spanish. Is that another triple major? Uh, Spanish minor, okay. Um, and she's an alumna of the National Hispana Leadership Institute where she completed her leadership fellowship at Georgetown University in May of 2012. So please join me in welcoming our panelists. And, and before, we, before uh, we open the floor to the panelists, I wanted to just get a show of you guys um, wondered if you could please show hands, how many of you are Maxwell undergraduates right now? Okay, great. And how many of you are Maxwell graduate students? All right. Uh, and are you, an, okay, alum. Okay, how many other alums? All right. Um, what about Teach for America alums? Do we have any Teach for America alums? Here, okay, great. Uh, and current Teach for America members? Anyone? What about visitors to the school this alumni weekend or an anniversary celebration weekend? Any visitors to the school? No? Okay, well, welcome again, and um, looking forward to our conversation. Uh, Dana, because you are immediately on my left, I think maybe if you wanna start us off by talking about your, your career and how Maxwell and your Teach for America experience have built skills that you're using today. Sure. Um, so again, I'm Dana Twyman. Um, originally from Philadelphia. I reside there currently. I was in the 01 core in New York City. I taught seventh grade literacy, which it was literacy. We did reading and writing. Yeah. Um, it was exactly that. Sorry. Do we have um, now? <laughs> so Adam and do I need volume, or is that me? Okay. Okay. Um, so I I currently work and live in Philadelphia, but I work for Johns Hopkins University, which is in Baltimore. Um, but we have a partnership with the Philadelphia School District, and so we work with city, area, and communities and schools, and we provide comprehensive services in the building. And so Johns Hopkins, we lead the initiative, um, and basically we work with the principals, the teachers, and the students. So we do a little bit of everything. And um, part of my role, the primary role, is to make sure that we're using data to inform our work, um, whether it's instruction or the initiatives that we provide services or support services for our students. Um, and so I, I, in my second, going into my third year in the position, um, school-based, I love being back in the school. I actually have been out of the school building uh, since I finished as a Teach for America Corps member uh, in 03. So it's really nice to be back around middle school students and supporting the, the work on the ground. 
Um, prior to that, I was actually a program director for diplomas now for city year. So same program, different role. Um, and my role was to support the principals in deciding how they utilize core members. And when I say core members, I mean city year core members uh, in their classrooms and in their buildings. Can you say a little bit more about city year? Sure. So city year is an AmeriCorps program. Um, so I think Peace Corps and their uh, AmeriCorps, Vistas, uh, same program. And so they actually volunteer. Um, so very similar to Teach for America, except we have a paycheck. Um, the core members, they actually volunteer for a year of service. And so a city or a lot like Teach for America has evolved over the last few years where um, they sort of did a, a lot of work in the communities, so whatever you wanted them to do. So they would clean up a park, they might paint a mural, um, but over the last few years, they've Target, targeted their focus on students who are underperforming and under-resourced schools. And so they pretty much provide a team of volunteers, um, high school and college, gra college graduates, and they uh, work with students around math, um, literacy, attendance, and behavior. And that's the focus of City Year now. Again, it's very different. It's evolved over the years. Um, but it's also a national core, and it's an AmeriCorps program. Um, tell me the other part. Just what, I guess part of the question about what skills you use uh, now that you maybe mm. began to build in Maxwell and then had to draw on when you were a teacher with Teach for America, um, we'll ask you also part of your experience with TFA and how it so dovetails. So we talked a, a little bit about this upstairs. Um, I think what I took away the most from my experience here in Maxwell was just to do something. Mm -hmm. Um, and so my experience here was very practical. Um, I don't know if Copeland still has the do good or do gooder <laughs> thing, but um, I took away from. I don't, I know, so, <laughs> but, it, but to me, that translated to do something. So if you're smart enough, if you're capable enough, if you have the skills, if you're informed enough, and there's a problem, come up with a solution. Um, and that's really what I took away from my experience here. It was very practical, and a lot of what I learned was through experience. Um, so we here, I worked with Parents for Public Schools of Syracuse. Uh, we had a program we started with community members here in, in the neighborhood where they received resume training, um, job skills training, and they were employed here through the university. Uh, I interned at the High School for Leadership and Public Service. So a lot of what I learned here was through experience. Um, and I think I value that. And so, you know, when you're a new teacher, you roll up your sleeves, you're in the classroom, and, and you receive a lot of support through Teach for America, which I think is different than going through a four-year program. Um, and you're with peers who are constantly challenging you and forcing you to reflect. But you really are on your own. Um, and so that's really the, the skills I learned here, which you have to figure out solutions. Um, and a lot of time, it's not the complicated, you know, you don't need a flow chart, you don't need, a, you know, it's very, they're very simple solutions. The difficult part is actually implementing it because you're working with a lot of unknowns. Um, but it, it, it's part of working with the team, figuring out what your resources are, and then just getting the job done. Great. Thank you. Robert, can I ask yeah. you the same? Yeah, good morning. I'm Rob Magliaro. Um, and I would, I would echo what was just said about uh, just starting from the skills piece. I think that the way I came to Teach for America was through the policy study program and getting involved in different things outside of the classroom. I did a lot of tutoring when I was here at Boys and Girls Club. Um, I worked at the Center for Public and Community Service and focused a lot on some of their literacy initiatives there, uh, as well as uh, getting students out to tutor in, in Syracuse. And so when it came to my senior year, uh, I had no idea what I wanted to do. I thought I wanted to go to law school to make money, because that was pretty much the only reason I thought I wanted to go to law school. Um, and it got to be you know, May, or like whenever the last deadline was, and I had been <laughs> contemplating Teach for America. And sort of through peer pressure, a lot of my friends had gotten into Teach for America, were really excited about it. I found myself promoting it to other people, but I never really thought of doing it myself. Um, and then I applied. and. Um, I got my first choice in New York City, and, and you know, the rest sort of fell into place. Um, and I think unlike some other folks who have had really tough um, teaching experiences in Teach for America, I was placed at a really, really good school in the South Bronx that really has their stuff together and are doing like amazing work. Um, and that's what kept me in the classroom. And, I, and really good schools are, uh, are hard to find in some urban areas. And so um, I had a really, really good Teach for America experience. Um, and I also lived with some Teach for America folk who did not have a great experience. So it was good to hear both sides of sort of the uh, issues in urban education in New York City. 
Um, and so then I, I taught for five years and slowly started to take on other responsibilities outside the classroom. Um, and my buddy and I decided that we could probably do a similar thing somewhere else because our school was so good and we had learned so much. Again, very practical learning um, the skills that it takes to run a school and teach students um, as you go. And so we applied and um, two years ago we opened a brand new high school that's now located um, in downtown Manhattan. And so we're in our second year, we have ninth and 10th grade students and we're growing it out to capacity um, in the next two years. Um, but I would say that in general, teaching specifically, but then whatever you get from the Maxwell program too should be super practical because really when it comes down to it, whatever job you get into, whether it be teaching or outside, um, you're forced to solve problems and work with other people. Um, my principal and I joke about the one thing that we always want our new hires to have, and we say it's, they have to be able to pass the copy machine test. So if you've ever used a copy machine, you know that after making a lot of copies, it jams. And so it's a very like, solvable problem, right? The paper is stuck somewhere in the copy machine, and there's directions that, give you, that they give you to solve the copy, you know, this jammed paper problem. But a lot of people just give up or don't bother to like, open the different drawers or take a risk to fix it. And I think that my experience here taking risks early on and sort of like low stakes internships and things like that gave me a lot of skills to go on and do what I'm doing now and do it well. Um, so I think that that's sort of the connection between Teach for America and the Maxwell School. So I came to the Maxwell School after doing the Teach for America two year commitment and my school actually had shut down the year after so it was kind of good timing. But what the reason why I come to get a public policy and MPA was because I taught in a rural area. A lot of what you hear in terms of education reform and education policy in general, and also critiques of Teach for America or other alternative certification programs, are very urban biased. The challenges are extremely different, but the outcomes are exactly the same. There's an opportunity gap. And what I wanted to learn was what's the difference between my anecdotal evidence that I experienced when I was in the classroom and what is actually the research telling me. And I th education policy is that one area where everyone can have something to say because everyone experienced education at some point in their lifetime. Or even a lack of education still gives you the credibility to talk about this education debate. But because there are experiences, they're not necessarily backed by data. And this is an opportunity, the MPA program, for me to do that. An example would be Professor Robert Bifolco taught ed policy when I was going here two years ago, his research is actually on charter schools. Some of his research is on charter schools in North Carolina. That's me. I didn't teach at a charter school. I taught right across the street from a KIPP school. That's me. So what I was learning was the exact opposite of what I had experienced about how, in this case, in North Carolina, students in charter school, if a student is going from a traditional public school to a charter school, they are going into a more segregated school than where they came from. So that's not my experience of what I had. The KIPP school across the street was more diverse than the school I was teaching in. So those are, those are sort of examples. And, and the data shows school segregation does not increase student achievement. So those are kind of examples. And, and that's what I brought to where I'm working now for Representative Rush Holt, um, who is on the Education Workforce Committee in the House of Representatives. He is, represents an area that goes from Trenton, um, the second largest, uh, not second largest, but sec uh, the capital of New Jersey and suffering through educational problems up to Scotch Plains, which is a pretty wealthy suburb in New York City, and Princeton's right in there, which is extremely affluent. So it's a, it's a wide, diverse district, and he cares. He used to teach at Princeton, so education is, is quite an important policy topic, and this is something we talk about all the time. Uh, so the, Also, Professor Trufas class around <laughs> regulatory policy, all this rulemaking process, if you're very interested in seeing how the executive branch of the White House can affect policy instead of the legislative branch in Congress where it originates from. The rulemaking process is one of the places they do that. And that's something I learned in the law class and is helping me now navigate the job. Um, hi, everyone. Good afternoon. I, um, I want to make sure I give some love because I know my back is to you all over here. Um, I think the headlines you're hearing of do good, find a problem, identify it, solve for it, and make an impact are also part of my story. My story starts in this room. 
specifically. Um, and I, I don't know, Copeland, if you still have folks read Savage Inequalities by Jonathan Kozel. I know I'm dating myself. Um, but read that book as part of the educational inequity like uh, series um, that we were studying at the time in uh, PAF 101. That was my module. Um, and it was through that, through course discussions, that I was able to finally have a framework uh, to start making sense of what my educational experience looked like before coming to Syracuse. Um, similar to my peers on the panel, um, I was on a pre-law track. When you're a first generation Colombian Guamanian daughter of two parents who didn't go to, to have a higher education other than high school, um, and our family's success was to become a lawyer or to become a doctor. Uh, and so I came to Syracuse. Uh, gratefully uh, as a Gates Millennium Scholar, as an inaugural scholar, as well as a Hispanic Scholarship Fund. And so education, I, I came to learn, hence my multiple degrees. I figured if someone was going to invest in my education, I should maximize it. Um, and, and when I was in this class, I started making sense and realizing that although I grew up in Colorado Springs, Colorado, um, and the challenges I faced because of the lack of quality education that I was getting in high school, when I was sitting in classrooms and lecture halls like this and kind of struggling, I was recognizing that this was part of something more systemic because when I was back in high school, I didn't actually see others that looked like me. I didn't see others that had the same struggles because being in a, a military family where you're going to multiple different school systems, you can't connect the dots and recognize that you are receiving an education that is not equivalent to your peers uh, when you're sitting in classrooms like this and realizing you haven't read half the books that your peers have read. Um, and so that's where my story begins and seats here. Um, I, I've always appreciated Copeland being like getting you fired up, getting you fired up about finding a problem and solving it. And then he just delightfully introduced Teach for America to me in this classroom. And I thought this was a perfect program before I thought I would be taking a break before I go to law school. Um, I have not, uh, I've actually been with Teach for America. I just celebrated my 10 years of service with Teach for America this past July. Um, after I graduated here, I went into the classrooms in Las Vegas um, and also wanted to have an impact in a Latino community. Um, growing up and embracing my culture as a Colombian woman, that was something that was important to me. I couldn't articulate that at 22, I'll be very honest. I've had a decade to work on my own identity and to think about what my, my presence in a classroom looks like, but I started making sense of it when I was in a classroom where I taught in an elementary school uh, that served K through second grade. Uh, my school only served those three grades because the educational inequity in the city, um, Clark County School District is the fifth largest school district in the country. Um, and at the time, there was a teacher shortage in, in Vegas where every year they were building 10 to 12 new schools uh, because they couldn't keep up with the student population that was coming into the city. Uh, and so when I went into Las Vegas, uh, my, my elementary school was Clyde Cox Elementary. And I predominantly taught a Latino community. Of the 900 students in my school, 97% identified as Hispanic. Um, I'm not fluent in Spanish. Uh, and that's okay. Uh, but I also recognize that when my students saw that I looked like them, that I uh, could, could relate to some of their cultural appreciations, and that their parents and parents of other students would flock to me to just come and talk with me. I did minor in Spanish. I love my mother, but she did not teach me Spanish. There's a lot of stuff with that, but we don't have time for that, or nor is this a panel to get into that to that conversation. Um, but I'm happy to share a little bit of that story with any of anyone who's interested. Um, but I was able to put my minor in use and become fluent and be able to have conversations and be a translator. My principal at my school would constantly ask me to translate stuff and I'd actually send it to my mom and have her like help me translate it to make sure that the grammar was correct. But I say and share all of that because it has led me to the career that I have now uh, to cope and solve for something. In the classroom, I was solving to ensure that my students who were in a second grade level but performing at a kindergarten level had a fighting chance to be on grade level by the end of the year. I have faced many challenges. It was not something I, I always reflect about, like, wow, all the things I could have done better, but I am grateful for the impact. And to think that my kids are now in high school blows my mind um, and the relationships that I still have with them. And I'm pushing Syracuse any chance we get. Um, just creating that pipeline a little bit early. <laughs> but I, I think about what made me leave the classroom, and I'll be real with you, I wasn't planning on staying in education since I was intending on going to law school. I thought that's where I could have the biggest uh, chance for impact. Uh, because I loved my students, I loved my community. Uh, but then I started actually understanding what it meant to have a diverse administration, a diverse leadership force in the classroom. When your population of students is 900, but when you look at the staff, our classroom teachers, and I was one of two Latino teachers in my entire school out of a staff of 70, 
that, that raises a lot of questions. You constantly, I think the courses like this make you constantly aware, that self-awareness of like something doesn't fit right, something doesn't add up. Uh, and so I've joined our organization, I've spent the last seven years to solve for uh, diversifying our, our, our educators. I specifically spend my energy in ensuring that we increase the number of Hispanics uh, that become uh, education, uh, teachers in our classroom. And when I joined about seven years ago, we were at 6% of our incoming core identifying as Latino in this past year. We've had about up to 13% to ensure that we are sending at least over close to 600 Latino teachers into our classrooms when I think about the students that we serve. So that's a little bit about me, and I'm happy to dive a little bit more, but I'm, and they, I'm so happy and humbled to be here. Well, it's fantastic, Patricia. I think one thing that both you and Rob addressed was sort of why you got involved in Teach for America, and I wondered if we could, I know everyone has a, a story about, about why, um, and you already sort of laid the groundwork for Maxwell, but why'd you, why'd you decide to, to join TFA? So I actually, here as a student in Syracuse, I thought that I wanted to do education policy on a state or federal level. Um, but I recognize the need to actually have the perspective of an educator before you go into education policy, because a lot of what I read, um, I thought, boy, the people who are making these policies have no clue. They must not. So um, I thought the experience was important. I'd actually never heard of Teach for America, and I remember sitting in Michelle's office. Um, and I, you know, I told her this idea, I, I kind of want to do policy, but I think I should teach first, but I don't want to go to the School of Ed. Uh, what should I do? And I was minor in, I was actually a, a minor in education studies. Um, and she said, well, you know, this is organization, Teach for America. Um, she says, you should look into it. Seems like the perfect fit for you. And so <laughs> I looked into it. it it actually, you know, in terms of what I wanted in the experience, um, had exactly what I needed. I applied to be in the New York Corps. Um, I was just telling some of the panelists is the only city that I wanted to go to. And um, I went to New York and I taught. And so, again, um, I, I sort of had an idea of the path that I wanted to take. And in terms of policy, I actually went to the University of Michigan for my MPP, Master's in Public Policy. Um, and I think as I learned more about how policies are designed and how um, they impact people in the community, particularly just in terms of education, um, teachers, students, and their families, for me, I think it was more important to get involved on a local level and just in terms of community-based work and grassroots work. Um, and again, a lot of that was my experience here at Syracuse, but I think that's where, for me, I was able to make the most impact. Um, and so I made the decision to actually go into the nonprofit sector um, because I just feel like it, on the ground level, that's where the work really happens. Um, and having that perspective as a teacher, as a former educator, you're, you really are, you have a different lens. And you see how policies impact our families and our students uh, and our teachers. Um, and so that work was important to me. And that's sort of where I ended up, how I ended up here. So my story is not as nice as everyone else's because it's just like <laughs> haphazard. TFA was holding an info session. There was free pizza there. My, <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> my told me to go. I was like, my mind on Teach for America had been, these are core members who go into their classrooms, and what you see is like in Freedom Writers and Stand and Deliver. I was like, I can't do that. Like, that, I'm not able to. And so I went for the free pizza. The info session is what got me turned on to it and started to make me understand this problem we were having um, and have been having and continuing to have. I still thought it was, and I was applying to Maxwell at the same time for the MPA because I wanted to do public policy. I wanted to do something important. Maxwell, once again, I just went on US News and World Report, saw they were number one. Central New York, I went to Cornell for undergrad. Love upstate Central New York and the Finger Lakes region, so I want to stay. That, that's why I applied to Maxwell. <laughs> Christine, the, yeah, sorry. Um, <laughs> I think those but, are good reasons. But, those um, are totally pizza and I'm saying yeah. 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 So it wasn't until I watched West Wing season finale of season two <laughs> where Mrs. Lanningham comes back and she's a ghost now and tells the president, President Bartlett, because he doesn't think he wants to run for re-election because it's going to be too hard. So she's like, if you don't want to run because it's too hard or you think you're going to lose, then I don't even want to know you. But if you don't want to run because it's time for you. <laughs> it's time for you to do something else, and I understand. I was like, well, that's been my fear of applying to Teach for America, is that it would be too hard. That's not an acceptable reason to not do it. So I applied, and I got in, um, obviously. But that, that's why. How was your experience? I'm curious. <laughs> I, I loved it. Um, 
I was in a rural area. One of the rural issues is teacher recruitment, yeah. regardless of or if you're coming from TFA or from a traditional education program. My school had 31 faculty, 15 were TFA, core members or alums. That's not because we were trying to overtake the school. It was because they can't recruit uh, traditional RAP teachers. And it was amazing how the non-TFA core members and the TFA core members really got along and affected change. The school was the worst performing school in the state of North Carolina the year I got there. We became a school of progress the, after the first year. Um, our test scores went from 33% proficient overall on test to 69. So that's, it, it feels good when you're able to do that. Mm -hmm. That being said, I have three students who over the past three months have are in jail or were killed, that's a failure. So it's just because a test score improves doesn't mean success is occurring. Hmm. That, so th those are observations I had. In, in that, yeah. Although what role does, do the statistics play for you all in your, in your work um, in terms of deciding whether to go on with your work? It drives, it's a driver. Um, and I'm at the policy level now. So. It, to me, these students have been fulfilling sort of a path that other society member, society sees, right? This is, they are the majority, they are not the minority. And at my, in my area of, of power, power is a bad word, in my area of influence, I can affect that through policy change. And, and so that's what keeps me going. I still talk to my students, that's, and I tutor, that's the way to keep in touch at, at the ground level, but where I am now, what are the policy areas that are the reason for that? Um, and if you, if you go back, I think early childhood education is, is one of these. I mean, if you are coming into high school at a seventh grade reading level, that's not setting you up to succeed over those four years. You're gonna gain five years of reading in under four years and do well on the SAT with Athletic College. That's, yeah, we'll work at it, but is, is that a high probability of happening? No. So it, that's sort of, and so what do we do? Well, let's look at the Child Care Development Block Grant. Let's look at Preschool for All uh, bills to universal pre-education, pre uh, pre-K education. So those are the kinds of things that. And it sounds like your school and my school were similar to the extent that there was a massive teacher shortage, as, as I described at my school. Although uh, 14 new teachers were hired and they were trained through traditional educational programs, they defected very quickly from, from my school. And what I knew was that in their place, what does a school do? If 12 teachers quit, what happens? How do they fill those gaps a month into the school year? The way they do it is they have long-term substitutes who aren't, who aren't required under union rules to come up with lesson plans or to, there's really very little accountability. So I knew every day, even though things were really challenging in my classroom, and you know, I think by three weeks in, I, I had a classroom management system where I was putting checks next to, you know, you get a warning, you get your name on the board, and now you get a check. I had gotten to a point I never anticipated where I had four checks after someone's name. You know, it was unclear what consequence followed four checks. So um, I was sort of at a point where uh, it was, things were very challenging. I didn't know what would happen. Um, but I knew, even though I knew I was struggling, I knew that in the room next door, my students were literally, same students in seventh grade going to a different class, they were watching Leprechaun for an hour with a long-term sub in that classroom. So I had as my baseline the idea that I, I was there, I was a face that they were seeing and they could rely on, and they knew that even if they were making it hard for me, I was going to be there the next day and the next day and the next day. And that was something I just, I set my standards for myself at that level and I pressed through, and I showed them, and then I broke through. I showed them that they could trust me, that I was going to be there the next day and the next day, and for the whole year, and then things started to turn around. So I had to sort of, I had to measure my, my progress quite uh, humbly and, and then just sort of stick it out. I don't know how you guys managed your, your classroom experiences at the beginning. Do you want to say something about, about your experience and how it went? Um, so when people ask me how my experience was, I say, oh, it was just how I expected it to be. Um, because I went to school in the inner city. I was in Philadelphia. went to public schools in Philadelphia. Um, and so I had that experience. I didn't think I was going to go into this tough inner city school where the, you know, the kids were 
walking around the halls and you felt unsafe. Um, I actually taught in the Bronx my first year. Um, and that school was taken over by the state. So we talk about policies and how they impact teachers and students. Um, the school was taken over by the state. And so at that time, because it was, it was underperforming. Yeah, yes, yep. so it was mm -hmm. underperforming and they had not made the progress and that was my first year. And so what happened was um, if you stayed, you, you actually, there were longer days, you were paid more, but there were longer days, maybe a longer year, I'm, I can't remember, um, but you had to commit to three years to stay. And if you left before the three years was up, they would find a way to take back money that you had made in terms of your salary. Um, and so I knew that I wanted to go to grad school because again, I wanted to pursue education policy, and so I knew my, I had one more year. Um, so Teach for America actually moved us, and so I taught in another school in Washington Heights, um, IS-90, which I believe is now a KIPP school, um, and it was a very. What's the address of that school? Uh, I don't know. Okay. Washington, it was Washington Heights is way up though, um, right before you get to the yeah, Bronx. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so uh, it was a similar experience. Um, I enjoy working with my students. I, I love reading, so I think that's important. I think a lot of times when you're a teacher, um, and sometimes even in Teach for America, you love math but you'll teach social studies. Um, and that happens to a lot of teachers, you know, based on your certifications. Um, but I, I, I enjoy reading. And so I was able to be passionate about what I work with with my students. Um, and I also had a, a way of making big things very simple and easy to understand. And so I took that into the classroom with me. I, I enjoy teaching. Um, I actually, most of my students, their family spoke Spanish. I thought I would learn Spanish. I did not, but I have Rosetta Stone now. Um, and so I'm on it. Um, but I, I had a really good experience. And again, even though I had an experience as a public school student in Philadelphia, it's very different than being a, a student who, you know, your parents are from Dominican Republic, you're new to the country. Um, and so my students' experience was different than me, but a lot of similarities. And I felt very comfortable in the classroom. Um, and again, I might have someone who was next to me, a Teach for America Corps member, um, who didn't have the same experience with the same students. You know, I felt really bad for him. Um, I would walk past his class at the end of the day, it would be trashed, it was chaotic. Um, but I think part of it is sometimes placement as well, because that same teacher, when we all had to move, he was placed in an elementary school. And I would see him at class, and I would ask how his experience was. It was a totally different experience as an educator for him, because elementary school was a better fit. And so sometimes I think it's just figuring out where your skills lend themselves the most and, and what you're most comfortable with. Um, but I, I had a good experience. I had an excellent experience. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> there it wasn't a lot of choice. And once you're in TFA, you get to choose your city, sort of. You rank order it, and then they, they place you somewhere. Um, and then they help you find a job. So they arrange interviews. And if you get hired, or at least this is how it used to work, um, you get hired, you accept the job. You have to accept the job. Um, and so I went to um, an interview at the end of the two train, if anybody's familiar with New York City, but it's the very, very end of the Bronx, um, and actually didn't get it. Um, and so the next day, they called me at like 8 o'clock at night, and were like, you have an interview tomorrow, 8 o'clock in the morning. It was the last day of school for New York City schools. Um, I walked into the building and talked to the principal for like 10 minutes, and they hired me. So like, there's like, a lot of it is there's staffing issues, and they know that Teach for America has this reputation of recruiting really uh, tenacious, um, smart, young, hardworking people who, if you put them in a classroom, they'll learn and problem solve. And so I think that was sort of the rationale, and that's the rationale we have at, at our school um, when we look at, at Teach for America um, recruits and someone who we can convince to stay longer because that's one of the issues we have is we want teachers to stay to create some stability um, in our schools. But I remember on the first day of school, I was 22. Um, I was walking across the, the lobby of the school, and we were a uniform school, so shirt, tie, dress shoes, black pants, and so we were supposed to model the uniform for the students. And so I was walking across the lobby, and some kid yells across the hallway, like, hey, what grade are you in? And I was like, oh, <laughs> like that's before interacting with any students at all. <laughs> and I was like, this is great. So I mean, you sort of have to like fake it till you make it. And I went up to him, shook his hand, and was like, oh, Mr. Magliero. Um, he was in my sixth period class that day. Uh, so <laughs> it, was, it was an interesting experience. I, I was in a middle school and high school, so I taught seventh grade math. Um, I do not like math. I do now, after teaching it. Um, but I was placed into math because of my economics degree. Um, and I, I taught seventh, seventh grade math, and I taught twelfth grade math. And because they need math. And they need math, right? yeah. yeah. Anybody want to come math teacher, please call me. Um, so <laughs> they, um, 
they put me in both, and it was actually a really informative experience to see where seventh graders were coming in and where twelfth graders were coming out in terms of math skills. A lot of times, I would use the same lesson, um, and so or just slightly, slightly changed. And there's the slight difference in working with seventh graders and twelfth graders, um, but it was really, really informative. Eventually, I went down um, to the middle school, and actually, one of my seventh graders. Um, during my first year as a student here now, in her first year. Um, so I started the pipeline in my school as well. So she, she applied and got in this year, so I was really excited about that. And I have, and I have students who are now, who are Teach for America core too, which yeah. is really exciting. And it actually is like, goes to the point about statistics and data. Like there's this gentle balance between um, using statistics and data to drive your motivation so you see progress. Because a lot of times when you're in the classroom and you're in it every single day, it's really difficult to see progress daily and motivate yourself. And so a few of the people I worked with became pretty creative with how we were collecting information to sort of see that progress outside of the anecdotals. Um, obviously over a five or six year uh, timeline, you, you start to see that progress tangibly, but it really, it really does motivate. Um, and so, you, but you have to balance it out because students also aren't numbers, and so the, a lot gets lost in the numbers when you're just looking purely at this is what they're scoring in your class or this is our proficiency rating at this school. Um, but I, I love the classroom I taught up until last year, even in our first year um, at the school, I made sure that I had two classes while doing administrative work. Um, so I'm, I'm missing the classroom this year, but I, I still love working with students. My first year was interesting. <laughs> I, w I also want to open the floor to questions when you're, when you're finished um, talking. But I, and before we do that, I just wanted to ask you, when you said you applied concurrently to TFA, I think, and, and to the MPA, did you have a deferral? Yeah, so when I saw I had gotten into both, I asked Christine if I could defer for two years. And there's a partnership, and the answer is yes. I just, yeah, I just wanted to, fl I wanted to highlight that there is this form, not just a kind of um, sort of established partnership in practice, but there's also a formal partnership between Maxwell and Teach for America, such that Maxwell will automatically defer your admission if you are um, going to do Teach for America. And they also will give a $5,000 tuition um, credit for TFA alums. So I just wanted to put that out there before you go. Go ahead. Yeah, so I, every day I woke up, I dreaded going to school. Every day I got back from going to school, I dreaded going to bed to wake up the next day to go back to school. It didn't. But whenever I could interact with the students outside of the classroom was some of the most fun times I had. And the, there was a second year TFA teacher there who sort of became my informal mentor. And she was like, in 10 years and whatnot, are they going to remember what you teach them in world history? My answer was, I hope so. Her answer was, probably not. So <laughs> what... But what will they remember? Well, they'll remember you caring about them. But how do you show that you care about them? It's not necessarily trying to ingrain in them certain answers to tests or, or what happened in 1945. But it's to see that they got a haircut yesterday, and they really like their haircut today. Or that there's a star on your basketball team, and he has no family who comes to the games. But when his teacher comes, he really enjoys it. And you get to talk about the game the next day. It was It's those kinds of things. So in... And at the same time, probably in October, I think Barack Obama gave an address, some speech, about public service. And he said, just know when it's really bad and you think you're not doing anything to help anyone, that you're becoming a better person. And, and that is, for me, that was true, was that even though each day was sucking for me, that I felt I was becoming a better person because of it whether that's knowing more about education policy or knowing what it's like to live in the place I was teaching. But so that was my first year. When they see you come back every day, the students know that you're there and you care about them, is, is what the professor was saying. My second year, completely different. So it, it's that thing. And you stick with it. You become a better person. They respect you more. They become better people, too. It keeps exponential. I just wanted to say one thing. Um, because I do, I think it's wonderful, and I think we have a lot of what I learned about working with young people is about building relationships. But I just wanted to put it out there for anyone who's interested in Teach for America, you do have to teach. Our kids need to learn how to read and write and do math, um, and we really need that. If you want to mentor, if you want to only talk about the baseball game, Big Brothers, Big Sisters, Boys and Girls Club, there are lots of community recreation centers. Our kids need to learn how to read and write. They need to learn how to do math. And I think that's one of the things that attracted me to Teach for America is the idea that students who are 
historically underperforming actually can do the work. And they just need the right person in front of them to help them do that and to pull out the potential. So I just wanted to stress that because I, I definitely have talked to a lot of more recent alum of Teach for America, and I want to make sure we're keeping with the original ideas that all, all children really can learn. And we need people who believe that and who are in the classrooms in front of them who challenge them on a daily basis and still notice that they got their hair cut um, or they may have a new hairstyle or something. So just putting it out there. Um, I'll keep it very brief because I'm anxious. We have a room full of people and I'd love to hear some questions. Uh, my experience, I, it was great. I, I, I think there's challenges, but oftentimes people who've had a really great experience are ones that have also faced a lot of hard challenges. I think when I reflect back on my experience, the one thing that comes to mind um, it is the parents um, and building those relationships. Parents were in my classroom all of the time. They are a critical component to the work that needs to get done and the investment. And, and I think about, I would not have been able to have had the impact that I had in my classroom. Um, I mean, I will acknowledge the support system. I also pursued a master's in education through our partnership with UNLV. I, 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 any resources that was out there, I ran after it because I wanted to ensure that my students were getting the education that they absolutely deserve. Um, but the one thing I did want to highlight was just the key involvement of our parents and our communities. And I'm not from Vegas. I do not have any ties to Vegas. And also knowing that I'm a part of their community and figuring out ways in which to be sure that like, I'm being respectful and thoughtful of the community while also engaging them so that there's like, a true collective path forward. Um, I'm Amy Snyder. I'm a graduate undergrad from Syracuse. I have dueled in poli sign history. I'm currently a public administration graduate student, and I'm an alum of TFA, Eastern North Carolina. Um, they hired me after Alex left, and they closed the school, um, so I took his job. Thank you for leaving so they could hire me. Um, so my question for you all is, um, there's quite a few of us who are alums, and we've been debating amongst ourselves as public admin graduates sort of um, what, what our responsibility is. Um, what we should do to stay connected to our community. Um, we sort of feel guilty about leaving our kids. We miss them a lot. Um, so our question for you is, what have you done to stay connected to where you taught um, and to the kids who you made such a great impact on? So uh, my, my experience goes way back. But, um, and, and I had two, I, went, I taught at two schools one, the first one is the one I described, my first one, um, and this was pre-internet, right? So, um, but even with, even had the internet existed, I don't think my students from that school would have been as um, linked up as my second school. So I am, to I am in contact with all of my students, almost all of my students, from my second school on Facebook, and we periodically have reunions, and they write to me if they need recommendations and so forth. The second school I taught at was in Harlem, and it was a uh, magnet school where students had tremendous family support, and it was, I mean, they, they, were, um, they were already plugged in and destined for really great things, um, although they all came from uh, backgrounds where, you know, they, it was a new thing for them, first generation. Anyway, I stay in touch with them on Facebook, and I used to periodically go back to Baltimore and meet with students and so forth, and they have kind of, that sort of trickled away, but I keep in touch with some Baltimore kids. And when I came here as a law student, I started mentoring and tutoring um, at Delaware Elementary here in Syracuse, because I felt so guilty about having left my students behind, and I'm still in touch with the students that I met in 1998 then and mentored. So those are some ways that I stay immediately in touch with those communities that I worked in and this community. First, I want to say don't feel guilty and don't let other people <laughs> make you feel guilty. I think that's one of the gripes about TFA is that we have a two-year commitment. Um, and a lot of folks say, well, you only spend two years. And I would say the year or the two years or the 10 years that you spend in the classroom makes an impact. Um, and that's valuable. And I'd rather have a teacher, a good teacher in the classroom for one year than a teacher who's not effective for 10 or 20. Um, so I would say don't feel guilty. But um, I would also say get in where you fit in. Um, I stay connected by continuing to advocate for young people. Um, I'm, I still work in a school, so I work with middle school students. I love middle school, and I know that's where I want to be. Um, I, I'm also serving on the board of a charter school, um, and I volunteer. I'm a mentor. Um, 
for a high school student. So there, I think there are lots of opportunities to t continue to stay connected and do the same type of work um, and make the same type of impact in a community, your community. For, for me now, my community is Philadelphia. And it's great because that's where I grew up. Um, so I feel even more connected. But I think there are lots of ways to get involved. It doesn't necessarily have to just be in the classroom. Um, I, the way I, I go back to Vegas actually every year um, to, to have some sort of impact. Uh, the one thing, the, it was a tough decision to leave the classroom. Um, and what made the decision a little bit easier was knowing that I was finding more teachers for them and students like them. I taught 62 students in the course of three years. And while I thought about if I stayed another year, I'd have another 30 students, another 20 students, uh, I recognized if I found 10 more teachers, 20 more teachers, 30 more teachers, and they themselves had 62 students of their own, uh, then we would actually have a greater impact. And so that's one way in which, and then just similar uh, to what has been shared as well, um, is just being an advocate, but also like I still keep in touch with my students as well. Um, and then uh, the work that I do currently in my role, I'm constantly, I spent the whole day on, uh, on campus yesterday connecting with college students to ensure that they're aware of their impact as well. And so, yeah. No doubt, I think uh, tutoring at uh, Say Yes and now at Horns Kids was a manifestation of, of that you, know, you were talking about, and also wanting to be involved continually in education. Um, but I, for me, that's probably the answer to your question. I would say, I have told myself, it's kind of hard to tell this to people who critique the leaving the classroom after two years, but that that was a decision I made based not only on what I was trying to do in the future, but also of how administration was treating its teachers. Mm -hmm. and so that that's how I, I justify that as well. Is there was an opportune chance for me to stay in the classroom. I wanted to do it after my first year of teaching. And it, because of many things that adults do to other adults and in terms of management, it's, it wasn't working out. So that, I mean, you, you are under the same administration too, so <laughs> you, you, you have an idea. But that, that's what I think. Yeah, I can't speak from experience of leaving the classroom, but I can say having worked at multiple levels of the system now, and at least within a school, that folks who leave the classroom and are able to contribute in some way to a systematic level change should keep their ear to the ground for the folks who are in the classroom. Because they know what's going on in the schools, they know what's going on with the students, they know how it impacts students. And I, I can give an example. When we opened the school last year, we were placed in a building on 49th and 10th. We, share, we had half a hallway and the, the rest of the hallway was another school, because um, they do a lot of co-location in New York City. We started our first year, we had a successful first month, and then in at the end of October, early November, they told us that at the end of the year, we would have to pack up all of our stuff and move the school downtown because of a mistake that was made at the system level. <laughs> and I feel like if there was someone who had had experience in the facilities, um, whoever made that facility judgment, uh, would have rethought that decision because it required us to make a lot of changes that took energy away from what we're all about, which is the students. And so I think that one of the things that TFA is really, um, part of their mission is to get leaders in um, parts of different organizations and business and even in departments of education to make those sorts of decisions that make sense for students. And so I think that if you're able to do that, then that's a good move outside the classroom also. Hi, um, my name's Maddie, and I was just asking, uh, looking to ask you guys a little bit about your experiences deciding between TFA going to grad school or law school or Alex specifically working on the Hill. Um, I've had experience interning on the Hill, and I absolutely fell in love with it, but it's not sure that that's where I want to go first necessarily if I grad when I graduate. So, and I've had experience with tutoring as well through SU Literacy course. So I was just wondering, I know it's not a perfect formula, but if you guys could go back, would you change anything about whether you went to school first and then TFA, TFA then school, or your um, regularly positioned jobs in nonprofit or on the Hill otherwise? I'm very happy that I went. I did Teach for America before I did grad school. It's helped me out academically as well as, as uh, with knowledge of education policy. Um, so for me, that's, that's how I, I would recommend doing that. But it's completely awesome. I'm glad I went right after undergrad because you need energy to work with <laughs> young people. And I'm not that old, but honestly, I still work with middle school students. They wear me out. So I'm actually 
glad that I did. Right after undergrad, when I, where I had the energy and the enthusiasm that you need um, to engage young people. Um, but I also think there's value in having some ex some other experiences, maybe even before you go into the classroom, because probably like a lot of us, you look back and you say, "Oh, I wish I'd done that differently," or if I had more experience, I would have, you know, d took a, taken a different approach. And so I think there's value in either way. Yeah, I wouldn't change anything. Um, I. Grad school's always there, um, it's not going anywhere. And I also think, for, I have a lot of peers who uh, did TFA that went into grad school, all, all types of grad school. And I think the conversations are different when you have your own perspective and opinion on something. Um, I think it allows for more critical conversations uh, and then experiences as well. And so I, I think, and I, I also think about urgency and what's happening in our, our country today and opportunity and the opportunity gap and so, I am also biased, <laughs> being on the recruitment team at Teach for America. <laughs> I think regardless of when you do it, you need to know that you like kids, you like working with kids, and you're going to put in the energy to become a good teacher. Because it's not like an experimental thing, like I'm going to try to figure out if this is for me. Like you're, going to be, you're literally going to be thrown in front of a classroom of 30 students, and you need to make sure that they learn that year. So I would just say, if whatever decision you make, that it's made knowing that you're going to have to dedicate 110% into going into the classroom. Um, hello. So I'm a sophomore studying international relations, and I'm kind of in that stage where I have no idea like what I want to do because that's a very broad major. Um, but actually, I want to know like how was your how do you think your experience was m different than someone that d had a four year, um, you know. Uh, did that for four years. So how do you think that was different for you than for them um, being on the same level as far as teaching students and all? And this is not to take away from traditional um, education programs, but I think one, one thing that Teach for America offers is the uh, network. And so you're constant, I don't know how it is now actually, but when uh, I was in Teach for America, we actually worked together very closely. We took grad school classes together because you had to work towards your certification while you were in the classroom. And so we were constantly reflecting on our work. It was a very thoughtful practice. Um, and we were challenging each other. And, you, and, and I've, I've read somewhere that one of the main things that takes teachers out of the classroom, regardless of your pathway, is support. And so you're thrown into the classroom. Now, in the building, it was very different. But I knew I had a network of peers who were like-minded, who were doing the same work. And so we supported each other. And that was important to me. And I'm and I, um, working with teachers now and seeing how they don't feel supported makes me value my experience with Teach for America more because I knew I had these folks who I didn't know. We all had different experiences, different backgrounds. Um, but we supported each other. And I think there's value in that. Um, well, I can't speak to the four-year traditional route. That's not my experience. Um, I can share the experiences of others. I echo a lot of what was just shared. Um, but I, I also think that there's value. I always think about, like, man, if I had four years of, of studying this, just like my insight and, and different perspective on it as well, and my knowledge about different things, um, that, that actually is what drove me to get a master's in education, because I felt like I wanted that additional, like the theory and the practice and the foundational skills. And so um, I, I, I don't feel confident in being able to tell you what the difference is, because that wasn't my story. Um, but I think that's a great question, because I do think that our core members um, and alums who do come from a traditional route into the classroom do have a very unique value add to um, our, our, our students in the classroom. And so I feel like that's a, a, the best what I can, I can share without projecting anything. So there were no, it was a pretty clear divide in terms of age in our school, it was up to 31 faculty. Older teachers were traditional route teachers. The younger teachers, 15 of them, were teacher and teachers. The, I can't speak to that, but what I can say is the only reason why we had any sort of teamwork together between the veteran teachers and the novice teachers is because we did not treat a traditional track teacher as any different mm -hmm. than us. And they had more experience than us. We would treat, I would ask them questions mm -hmm. all the time, but in no way was I better than any, anyone else there. Uh, so a, I think the mentality of it, and if you look at the data, the result, the results go both ways in terms of alternative certification through Teacher America and, mm -hmm. and a traditional four-year program. And traditional four-year programs aren't created equally either. Mm -hmm. But um, in the end, it, performance is about equal to, on a good four-year track and a good alternative certification track. So it, depending on experience and teaching. So it's, 
your experiences are different in terms of education, but in the classroom, it's the same thing. So you're in, you're in it together. I actually have a, a twin brother who went through a four-year education program, and then <laughs> I did TFA. So it was like a very interesting experience, and it makes for some really interesting like dinner table conversation that usually has to end at some point. But um, we we would call each other all the time. I started one year before him, um, and. It's just the, it's really about the support in your school and who you reach out to to help you as a first year teacher. As a first year teacher, you're gonna struggle regardless. And there are some four year teachers who won't be as good as first year teachers because they don't reach out to get support. So it is about the people that you work with and who you ask for help when you're actually in the classroom. Unfortunately, I think we, we won't be able to take any more uh, questions on the panel. Perhaps panelists will be available after here, but I think there's also, um, well, uh, yes. <laughs> Some remarks will follow here. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I'm supposed to close this panel, but I, I, there's not much I can say except I'm so proud of, of these graduates. I'm proud of you all for being interested in this. I still am blown away by Wendy Kopp, who was the founder of Teach for America, who was a senior in college and wrote a thesis and then did something about it and got the money and figured this whole thing out and created this institution that has made a huge impact on undergraduate, uh, on uh, high school, K through 12 education, even pre-K now. Um, it's amazing, it's amazing. And think about how one person could create this system that then allows all, everybody else to give. So I wanna thank the panelists, you were, you were fantastic. I thought this whole thing was fantastic. <laughs> A Teach for America recruiter is over with food in 105 Maxwell. Pizza? Is there so pizza? So you should go over there and get some and talk. And I know some students want to talk to you. Um, and one had to leave. She's very upset. She wants to talk to you because, you know, the whole deal. So anyway, thank you very much. <laughs>